Okay, uh, today is November 20th, the year 2001. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson here at the Palm Springs Air Museum with Don Sutherland. Uh, Don was a ball turret gunner uh, in World War II, and then in Korea, he was called into the U.S. Army. He was a combat MP, ended up fighting with the infantry. So nice to have you here, Don. Thank you. Tell me, when and where were you born? Glendale, California. And when was that? July 6, 28. That's 1928. Uh, what did your dad do? My dad was a Navy career man. Oh, really? Oh. When did he join the Navy? In World War One. Was he? Did he? Oh. What did he do in World War One? Oh, he got a bullet in his back. He died with a bullet in his back. Oh, really? And uh, he, he saw action in World War One, but in World War Two, uh, because of his age, he was just more of a desk jockey. Uh -huh. <clears throat> How did he get wounded in World War I? Uh, that I, uh, he never elaborated too much on that. Was he on a ship? Or? Yeah, he was on a ship. Uh, do you, uh, was he like in the North Atlantic somewhere, or do you know where he was? I don't know exactly where he was at. He never uh, talked much about it. Uh -huh. The only thing I do know is that he had a bullet still in his back that they never took out because it wasn't necessary. So oh. when he passed away, he still had that bullet in the back. Oh, okay. Uh, do you know what kind of ship he was on? No. Okay. So. Um, and where where did he uh, where did he grow up? Where, where did he or was he? He grew up here in California. In California, yeah. Also? Uh -huh. Yeah. He, he was born in Canada, and oh. then became a U.S. citizen. And he, well, basically, he and his dad both came from Canada. Oh, okay. And, um, and then they came to Los Angeles. Yeah. He lived in Los Angeles, up on top of uh, what do they call it, Knob Hill, I think it is, uh, which is torn down now and there's high rises there now, but he used to take the angels flight every once in a while. What's that? What was that? It's that little cable car that goes up and down oh. from Knob Hill. They, they just recently restored that again, uh -huh. so I guess people can just take it as a joy ride. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, your mom, or, or what was your dad's name? John Dean Sutherland. Uh, by Jack. Uh, oh, okay. And uh, what was your mom's name, her maiden name? Van Pelt. P E L T. L T. What was her first name? Ruth. And uh, where did they, uh, when, where, when did they get married or where did they meet? Uh, they, they met in Los Angeles and they got married in 25. And did your mom, well, your dad obviously traveled around a lot in the Navy then. Yes. Did your mom, what did she do before she got married? Was she working anywhere? Or? She was working as a stenographer, shorthand, typist. What, um, well, it's, uh, you were born in Glendale. Yeah. Um, how, well, tell me, um, obviously you probably moved around somewhat too. Tell me some of the places that you live. Well, I basically, um, was in L.A. My dad was still in the Navy, and I was still living in L.A. And then in 1937, the Navy Department uh, transferred my dad over to Hawaii. And as a result, I saw Pearl Harbor bomb with my own eyes. I was living in Iaea, which is up on the side of the hill, which had a panoramic view of Pearl Harbor. And uh, my dad was, was home that Sunday morning. And every time something would blow up, my dad just kept saying, oh my God, oh my God, he just sounded like a broken record. Uh, what did you think at the time? You were 12 well, years old? Well, I was 13, 13. And I knew that things were wrong. Of course, they're all during the year 1941. Um, there was a lot of tension between Japan and this country. Uh, so we knew that war was inevitable. And you were just, aware of that too. Right, right. I, I was aware of it. And um, <clears throat> uh, I'll never, uh, just to, before I go into the history a little bit more, I just want to say that uh, 
on the attack of Pearl Harbor, on the second wave that came over, um, one Jap plane came over, lowered the house, he had the canopy back, and he was leaning out over the edge of the plane, and he waved down at me with his big grinning teeth. And like a silly 13-year-old, I stood there and I waved back at him, even though I could see the big red beat ball in his wing. <laughs> I was too dumb to realize the difference. And uh, but now going into my family's history, my okay. Let me back up just a second. Did you see the movie Pearl Harbor? Oh yes. Did was it similar to that? I no. mean, at all? No. Or, I mean, Torah, Torah, Torah was much more authentic. No, I'm talking of not the whole movie itself, but I mean, when you, you saw him coming over that big hill and then going down oh. and going through the canyons and stuff like that. I mean it. That, the hill you're telling me about that you lived on yeah. sounds similar to well, what yeah, they, you saw. They, they, they came over the hills from the north side of the island, and it's mount, actually mountains. Yeah. And uh, then they came down and, and they started their attack right on, on Pearl Harbor. Uh, as far as flying in between the ships like the movie show, no. <laughs> no, I didn't tell that. But, uh, but nevertheless, I mean, I think, in the, I think in that movie too, I think there were some kids looking up. Uh, well, like I, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, in Torah, 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 where they showed um, the, uh, the people out there picking pineapples the Sunday morning and then the planes flew over, that was true. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. And also my old car was supposed to be in that movie, but it didn't turn out to, to be that way. I had that 41 Ford, uh -huh. and uh, that was over there. And when they started, before they started filming Pearl, or Torah, 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 um, one day I had the car parked down in Waikiki, and when I, it was in a residential section, and um, when I was going back to my car, uh, this man was sitting, or sort of leaning against the front fender, and I wondered, well, gee, did I park in somebody's driveway? I wonder what the heck is going on. And he told me then, he says, is this your car? And I says, yes. And he says, well, we're looking for old cars before the war. And I says, why? And he says, because they're going to make a movie called Tora, 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 which is the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And, uh, and we would like to know if we could rent your car and, uh, and use your car in the movie. And I said, well, sure. Well, then they started their front filming Tora Tora. And the first scenes uh, uh, was actually the bombing of the Arizona. Because I remember being down at Pearl Harbor and I could see all the black smoke going up in the air and all this kind of stuff. And um, uh, so weeks went by and I kept waiting for a phone call. And I never received this phone call. You know, like, what are they going to do with my car? When are they going to use it? And um, so, um, uh, so finally, I tried to get in touch with them. Well, I didn't know who to call, but boy, through the chain of commands, I finally got to the person, and I uh, said, uh, "My car was supposed to be used." And he says, "Yeah, I know." But he says, "We found a red 39 uh, Ford um, uh, four-door convertible." And he says, we use that one instead. So if you remember the movie and you see that red Ford convertible in there, uh, that was probably about three quarters of the way through the film, uh, that red convertible uh, <laughs> took the place of my car. Tip, tip your billy your cap back just a little bit so you get to see uh, a bit more light on your face. Yeah, that's good. Right. Okay, um, in, okay, growing up, uh, what year did you go over to Pearl? 1937. 1937. So you were about nine. I was. Um, eight or nine. I was nine. Nine years old. Yeah. Okay. Where did you go to grade school in, in L.A. then? Well, school? All right, uh, up there in, in Eagle Rock, I went to grammar school. Was that the name of it, Eagle Rock Grammar School? Well, no. It was. Oh, I forget the name of the school. Well, San Rafael was one of them, also. But um, uh, then when I went to Hawaii, I don't remember. Really these Hawaiian names, I can't remember them all. <laughs> yeah. And um, <clears throat> now, what your dad uh, was he uh, stayed on a ship over there? Or, or? No, no, he was strictly a, a um, uh, what I called to uh, the desk jockey, uh -huh. worked in offices and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But you see, now what happened? What brought us back was that, um, uh, as I said earlier, in, in all in 1941, um, there was a lot of tension. And my older brother, who, uh, when he got out of the 11th grade in 1941, instead of getting a summer school job like most kids did, uh, he wanted to be patriotic, so he joined the Army. 
And of course, that's made my dad a little bit unhappy, being a Navy man, because he wanted him or me or both of us to go to Annapolis, and neither one of us did. And uh, so my brother uh, joined the Army, and he took his training over there, and then he got shipped to the Philippines, and he was in where did you Where did you take his training? At Schofield. Oh, okay. And then, um, <clears throat> um, and then um, he got shipped to the Philippines, and he worked under Douglas MacArthur, and then he got caught in that Bataan Death March. And to this day, we don't know if he was ever bayoneted on the side of the road or was decapitated if he made it back to the prison camp. And what is so ironic is the fact that uh, the Death March started, I think, on April 9th, and he, uh, he would have been 18 on April the 15th, and we don't know if he ever saw or lived to see his birthday or not. And it was such a traumatic experience for my folks, which is understandable, and it left an impression on me also uh, with a lot of hatred. And um, so um, the Navy uh, shipped my dad back to L.A. Uh, um, in, um, I guess it was, uh, I guess it was around May of 41. I'm uh, 42. 42, right. <clears throat> and. Um, so he just worked, as I say, as a desk jockey. Well, then in 44, um, I was in junior high, and, uh, and in, uh, after the Normandy invasion, uh, I could sort of see that the war was turning around in our favor. And because I had the hatred that I did, I wanted to be patriotic and, um, and, and, and serve my country also. Well, I didn't want the Navy because I didn't like the idea of being sunk down the bottom of the ocean with an iron coffin wrapped around me. And I didn't want the Army because of my brother's experiences. So, and uh, it was sort of a God's gift sin that I was uh, born to use my hands and tools. And uh, uh, before I retired, I was a swimming pool contractor. And of course, there's all kinds of tools that you use there. And so I was very handy with tools. That's why I have my old car today, and I have other old cars too, or, or I have Adam also. And um, so um, uh, there was hardly a, th a thing that I couldn't fix if you put the right tool in my hand, except my wristwatch. But um, uh, so I decided that I wanted to be patriotic, and I figured, by golly, I'm going to join the, try and join the Air Force. Mind you, I was only 16 at that time. But it took a lot of red tape and string pulling, and of course my dad helped. And um, <clears throat> and so uh, after many interviews with the uh, recruiting office, um, they, they finally uh, called me down and said, okay, we, well, the Air Force is guaranteed to accept you, but we cannot guarantee to make a mechanic out of you. And I figured by this time, okay, so what, I've gone this far, that's to it. So they sent me down to Arizona, near Tucson, take basic training. And the second day that what, I... What was the name of that place you took? I think it was called Morano or something like that. Morana, Morano? Tucson. Uh, it was near Tucson. Yeah. Okay. And um, <clears throat> so the second day that I was there, the second lieutenant came out with a clipboard full of papers and he lifted up the papers and he read them and he called out my name and he walks up to me and he eyeballs me from foot to head and back down to my feet. He looks at the papers again like he couldn't believe what he was reading. And he looks at me again from head to toe and he says, mechanic be damned. He says, any fat man can become a mechanic because you're the perfect size of fit in that. And with that, he points to a B-17 sitting on the ground at, at the ball turret. So then it was off to Kingman, Arizona for five weeks of, um, of uh, gunnery school, basic, uh, yeah, good five weeks of gunnery school in Kingman, Arizona. So you have to go in Kingman. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to back up just a little bit here. Okay, what was your uh, what was your brother's name? Um, uh, William. Uh, I'm sorry, John William. <clears throat> and did you have any uh, any other brothers and sisters? Yes. Um, I don't know if you're aware. Uh, last weekend we had. Uh, uh, Baton. I know it. I read that. And we have a display downstairs. I don't know if you've seen that or not. Was oh, it in the Navy hangar? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll take. It. I'll take. If you like to, I'll take it and show it to you. Uh, okay. So you're. Uh, 
So you're gunnery school in uh, uh, King Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Okay. How long were you there? Five weeks. What was that like? Well, I learned a lot of things mighty fast. <laughs> Had you ever done any hunting or anything like no, that? No, I never shooting? did. No, I never did. And uh, that's what, well, first of all, they started you off shooting a BB gun. And then after that, they went into shotguns with skeet. And then after that, I went into, the, into 30 caliber machine guns. And then I went into 50 caliber machine guns. And then they had mock-ups of the ball turret on a tripod with a plywood floor, and they had all the controls, the electronics and the hydraulics, teaching us how to get in and get out and, and how to work our different pistol grips, because one pistol grip would make that ball revolve 360 degrees around. The other pistol grip made it um, go up and down vertically 90 degrees. So in other words, it was my steering wheel, just like your car. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, I took my training there. Um, I, uh, I was one inch over the rigs. The, the regulations was five foot eight. I was five foot nine. And, um, <clears throat> but uh, it, uh, as I said, this happened toward the end of the war. And uh, by this time, a lot of uh, ball turret gunners uh, were either captured, killed, wounded, or prisoners of war, whatever. So there was a great demand for ball turret gunners. And uh, because we're sort of a special people, we're not necessarily midgets. But at the same time, we're not a big football player either. <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, that, but I wore the chest. Pa I'm sorry. I wore the backpack parachute, so I would move the uh, back lumbar that we have on our plane, and I would lean directly against the steel plates. Mm -hmm. So that made me very comfortable leaning down on the job. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> uh, did you? Uh, was it fun shooting guns? I mean, trying, well, uh, trying to uh, hit things and stuff. It was fun when I was in basic. Because we we That's did find mean. right uh, 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 in the mock-ups of the with the tripod we would shoot at, at targets uh, fixed targets uh, at, and um, and try to see how well we did at aiming and all that kind of stuff and then we graduated uh, well, we didn't graduated but we then went into uh, a, another plane towing a target and then I sat in the B-17 and shot the gun the ball turret from the B-17 and that was my only experience at shooting. Uh, from uh, B-17 because by the time I got over there, the war, as I say, was winding down and I flew the last three missions. And, well, in fact, when I got over there, uh, they didn't stick me in a ball turret immediately because by okay, the Okay, well, let's see. Okay, where did you fly to then? Where, where did you? I went straight to uh, Chelvest in England. From, from King? From Kingman? Uh, no, they went to ship me back east and then I went over. Uh, where did you go back east then? Um, up in Maine, I think it was. Bangor, maybe. Yeah. Okay. And then over to, where did you say in England? Chelveston, England. C-H-E-L-V-E-S-T-O-N. Okay. And uh, yeah, that was a B-17? Oh, well, tell me. That was a, a B -17 the 305th B Bomb Group. I was in the 364th Bomb Squadron. And um, when I first got over there, because the war was coming near in the end, there wasn't many casualties or POWs, so there, at that point they didn't really need a ball turret gunner. So they made a caddy out of me for a while. I was washing windshields and pumping up the tires and cleaning up the plane, sort of like the ground crew, really. But then I guess they felt uh, uh, they'll give me a chance, so I flew the last three missions. And the, the last mission was on Wednesday, April the 25th, 1945. And the target was Pilsen Skoda Czechoslovakia, which was an ammunition manufacturing plant. And on that day's combat mission, the last combat mission, they had some leaflet missions afterwards. But on that last mission, um, there were 589 bombers in the air that day. And um, there was no aerial combat because the German Air Force was already in ruins, and for those few planes that were not in ruins, they didn't even have gas for it. But they still had flak, and they shot up the flak at us, and out of the 589 bombers, we lost six. It is unfortunate that, that um, now that's not the same, the one bomb group, I mean, there, yeah. there was lots of bomb groups to make up these, this total. So it is unfortunate that we had to lose anybody on that last combat mission. But when you really stop and think about it, six out of 589 is a rather small ratio. So, okay. Uh, did, so then, 
Did you come back right away then? Not right away, uh, but soon right away. <laughs> um, uh, they gave me and the ground crew uh, a lot of flights over Berlin, I mean over yeah. Berlin and other German cities that were heavily bombed and uh, so I could uh, see what all happened. To say I, I didn't get to see much, most of that. And, um, Did you do any relief missions where you take food and stuff? To no, food no, I, I, did, stuff I, didn't, and I didn't get to honor any of that. Yeah. And then uh, what happened then, um, they sent me back to Kingman, which was the gunnery school. They sent me back to Kingman to wait out to see if I was going to be needed in the Pacific. And uh, so as a result, Japan uh, gave up in 1945 also. So um, I wasn't needed in the Pacific. And then in November of 1945, they came along and gave me my honorable discharge. And they said, now look, we know you didn't go to high school, so you are now a civilian. No reserves, you are a civilian. Uh, go back to high school and get your high school diploma, which I did. And, um, and then, um, um, that was, you went back to Glendale? No, Angle Rock. Eagle Rock. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm not sure where Eagle Rock is. Eagle Rock High School. It's a little community, it's a suburb of, of Los Angeles. Um, uh, it's between Glendale and Pasadena. And uh, uh, so, at any rate, um, uh, also at that time, it was uh, by so law. So, how old were you then when you went back to high school? I was 20 oh, really? when yeah. I graduated, that is. Were there other guys your age back in high school? Like, like when you uh, there was another guy that probably was about my age. He was in the Marines and he was in Iwo Jima and then he, got, oh. and then he came back and uh, finished high school. And I, there may be others, but I don't know about yeah. them. Um, <clears throat> uh, now I, so at this time it was mandatory that uh, everybody had to, when you were 18, you had to sign up for the selective service, or known as the draft. Well, I did it because I had to, it was law, and uh, I didn't think much about it. I mean, we just got over a huge war, Who, uh, what, what dangers are going to be for another war? So I signed up by law, and then in 1950, when Korea broke out with no advance warning at all, guess who was one of the first ones to be grabbed? I guess my Uncle Sam figured that, hey, we spent a lot of time and money training this guy. We didn't get much out of him in return. So I was one of the first ones grabbed. And of course, I was on my knees and begging and borrowing and crying crocodile tears, trying to get back in the Air Force. But I couldn't convince them because uh, I was honorably discharged. I signed up for the draft, and that was it. There was no reserves. And if I had known that Korea was going to come along, I naturally would have gone down to the recruiting office and tried to get in the Air Force again. So as a result, they sent me up to the Ford Ord, and they gave me a little refresher course. I think the the normal basic, the normal like the basic training is something like uh, I forget for sure, but I think it was 16 weeks. But uh, they sent me up there for about three weeks just to give me a little refresher course, and then then they stuck me on a troop ship and um, over to Japan I went, and then every day they would call out hundreds of names because they were going to go to this uh, division or that division or whatever, but they didn't call my name out. Okay, was fighting in Korea going on at this oh, time? Oh, yes. Yes, the, the, this was in... So when did Korea, when did it actually, when did it... Korea started on June 25th, 1950. Now let me ask you, had you completed, had you finished high school by this time? Oh, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. okay let's back up a little bit. Uh, did you work while you were going to high school, going to school? No. What did you do when you... When I got out of high school, I sort of goofed around. <laughs> I, uh, I, I would, if, if I saw a job that looked appealing to me, I would have applied for it. But otherwise, I didn't put my nose on the grindstone and really go out, try to go out to get a job. I was just sort of goofing around a little bit. Yeah. And um, but it didn't, it didn't take much goofing around before. Um, yeah. There was only two years of goofing around, then Korea broke out. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> so. Um, so you're in Japan. So I was in Japan. And, uh, and I was wondering, a lot of guys uh, already got called and shipped over to Korea. And I was well, had, what, had they put you into the MPs by this time? Or? Well, that's, that, oh, okay. that's, that's what I'm coming to. Yeah, okay. um, then, then finally one day they called out my name and a, and a few other guys, and, um, and they, uh, they sent me to um, combat MP school in Japan. 
So I was sort of lucky again. Well, I guess one way or the other, my Uncle Sam was going to make a special gunner out of me. It's a bolter a gunner or a combat MP. <laughs> okay, well, tell me what, it, what is a combat MP? Uh, it's a, it's a guy that uh, uh, directs uh, traffic, uh, heavy armament, uh, directs them around. Uh, that's a combat MP now. Uh, that's what I mean. Right, MP. right. Uh, make sure the tanks go down this road and the trucks go down the other road or whatever. And uh, now a regular MP, uh, they just sort of patrol around, write up a DR, which is, means delinquent report, and uh, and, and that. did you have sidearms or what? Did you oh yes, I had a, I had, I had my 45 and I had a carbine, and um, so. Uh, I, I, so what did you think of all the things they could have sent you to? I mean, what what would you have thought about this? What they, what you, I was I was angry. I was angry because uh, I, I got stuck in the army after right. all, yeah. and um, uh, they would not accept me back in the air force, which I wanted to get into. But I sort of, in one way, I felt okay. If I have to be over here, I did feel a little bit lucky being a combat MP rather than an infantryman crawling on my belly through right. everything. Um, but, uh, and I entered Korea on, in September uh, 20th, I think it was, uh, 1950, and I saw Seoul liberated in, on September the 20th. Where did you go into Korea? For, through, through Incheon. Incheon. Did they, did, how did you get there? Fly or on ship or what? Uh, no, it was by boat. It was by boat and landing craft. By this time, Incheon had already been invaded, and uh, so therefore, uh, uh, it wasn't under combat conditions. Okay, I want to go to the map here a little bit. This doesn't show Korea really blown up by, but tell us kind of, I think, pretty much where in relation to Japan, China, and some of this stuff is. So here, let's take that pencil. Maybe you can. I let, will. Let, let me move over here. Just let me get this into here a little bit. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move up here a little. Okay, I see. Is that the Chosen Reservoir up? Up here, they're talking about. I'm trying to find Korea. Well, I think it is. It this. Yeah, this is. They, the, the, this is probably yeah, there's Busan. 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 Okay, it's sort of strung outside horizontally. Right. Yeah. Uh, I guess because of the because of the way that right, thing is. Right. That's Japan. So, in other words, I left Sasebo on boat, and I actually uh, came around and landed in Incheon, okay. and um, <clears throat> with the other troops. And where would Seoul have been? Seoul. Well, it yeah. should be on here because I see yeah. Pusan. I see Pusan. Uh, Seoul. Uh, you're right. It's not on here. It's about in the center of the. This here looks like the 38 parallel. Probably so. Seoul. Yeah. Yeah, it's not on here for some reason. And before we, uh, we'll get to this a little bit. But when you got wounded, where, where, where were you? I was you above the 38 about? parallel in, in a town of, uh, or I don't know if it was even a town, but it was a village called. Um, Kumwa. Okay. Okay. We'll we'll get to that. But so that's near the 38th parallel. Well, yeah, we'll just look. a little bit above the 38th parallel. Okay. That, in fact, Kumwa uh, is sort of like a triangle. There was Kumwa and another city of which escapes my memory right at the moment. And then on top of that was the uh, Puma. I can't say it. Pumanjam. <laughs> oh, Panmunjom. Is that where they right. signed all this? Right. That's stuff. where they sort of made a, a triangle, and uh, and uh, Kumwa was over to the right. How do you spell Kumwa? Uh, K. Um, excuse me for a minute. Let me get get out the print. Oh, sure. Right. Go ahead. Okay. I can always see the printer later too for that matter. That's right, that's right, yeah. We'll, we'll, I'll pick that up. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I just need to I think it's K U M or K H U M. I got it right here. K U M W H A. Oh, okay. Okay, so. Um, so you go out, you're, okay, you land in Inchon, and and I saw the liberation of Seoul. Yes. Okay. And then I spent the rest of 1950 and all of 1951 all up and down Korea. I've got up as far as the Yalu River, down through the Chosin Reservoir, through that fiasco as a combat MP. I wasn't with the Marines, 
but uh, as a combat MP, I, I was sent everywhere. And uh, that, um, during that time, um, we were retreating. Was that kind of chaotic? I mean, I yes. suppose you had were trying to direct traffic. And I was trying to direct been, traffic, and uh, what was and, that like? Everybody, it was panicky. It was it was very panicky because by this time the Chinese was entering the war, and after we got all the way up to the Yellow River. Uh, with just the North Koreans only, and then we thought well, if the war was going to come in, and we'd be home by Christmas. But uh, it didn't turn out that way. And uh, so on the retreat, and then that's when <clears throat> Seoul was recaptured again, and, um, uh, and then MacArthur was fired, which I have personal feelings about. <laughs> what, have, what are your feelings about uh, that? I think it was wrong. I think it was wrong that he should be fired. Um, you have to remember that he's still the number one scholastic uh, member of, of West Point today. Nobody has ever passed him up. And um, he used every island in the Pacific Ocean for a stepping stone to Japan. I think he was a brilliant strategist. He might have been a demagogue, but so was Patton. And, um, but uh, he was my number one general in my mind. And uh, I know did, that did okay. Let, let's think about two things. One, at the time, what were your thoughts about going into China, and what are your thoughts nowadays? Are you did you even think about it then? Well, of course, the the, the war at that time, the war had only the World War II had only been over for about five five years, six years at the greatest, um, um, and we already used the atomic bomb. And of course, there was talk about using the atomic bomb in China, and that's what MacArthur wanted to do, was to bomb Manchuria to uh, uh, break up the uh, the Chinese uh, buildup that they were having, and uh, and that that would my feeling is that that would let the rest of the world know that we still have the bomb and we still mean business and don't mess around with us. But of course, uh, the more I hear and see and read about it. Um, Truman, uh, in my opinion, um, was the wrong man to, to make this choice, but he did. But I guess uh, he was going against um, uh, policy that the, uh, that the the president is supposed to make. Uh, in other words, as Truman said in one of his <clears throat> films that I saw, <clears throat> I'm trying to stop World War III, and he's trying to start World War III. So um, I have mixed emotions on it, but I still think it was a mistake because I think he was a great general. Yeah. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> now Seoul has fallen. You guys are you know, retreating. Right. So yeah. how far did you retreat? Not too far. <clears throat> it wasn't anything like the Pusan perimeter, which would have been another Dunkirk had we not invaded Incheon. That's another thing I like about MacArthur. I mean, he, he was such a brilliant strategist because everybody thought that that would be the last place to try and invade. But he was clever enough. He figured out the tides and what he'd have to do. So that's why I respect the man highly. But uh, at any rate, then the, um, um, not Van Fleet, but um, Matt, uh, 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 Ridgeway, Matt, yeah, Matthew Ridgeway, right. Uh, he was in command at this time. And then uh, it, we, we slowly but surely pushed him above the 38 parallel. And it was just sort of a stalemate back and forth, back and forth. And that, that went on the whole year of 1951. And um, and then it was on um, on January in, in the middle of December, mid December, um, they'd already taken away my um, MP status. Not that I was did anything wrong or anything, but they they needed riflemen in the worst way because the lines were spread thin, and um, there was like uh, we we had to the orders were to hold the line, and there was two men to a position. And we would sleep one hour on and one hour off, and, and that went on for a few days. And then someone of the higher command decided that they wanted Chinese prisoners of, uh, to capture for interrogation. So they uh, formed up two uh, squad companies, and I was in charge of, of one uh, squad. There were nine men in there, and uh, uh, we hiked up a hill, and I got a look at the lay of the land, but it was... Uh, um, and then f uh, five of them disappeared where I don't know. 
and there was only four of us. And then later on, 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 uh, um, on January 12th, um, 1952, at midnight, uh, the, there was a captain, and he told me to form up a squad, and I had six men, counting myself, there were six of us. And um, uh, so um, I, uh, I, I had to try and look over this one peak of the mountain to see what was on the other side, and I could see a, um, an enemy uh, bunker. It was a circular trench type uh, bunker. And um, uh, so um, I told, uh, I, I ran back and, um, and I um, told the guys what we were going to do. We were going to come up one at a time and drop down and try to capture that bunker without killing them. And um, so I ran up first and I hid behind a little bush that was leafless. It didn't really hide me. And of course there was snow on the ground, and uh, so the, the enemy had lots of black specks to shoot at, because <laughs> we were, certainly weren't camouflaged in white, that's for sure. And what were you carrying then? I was carrying, I still had my carbine, right, right and, my, and my sidearm. And uh, no, I take it back, I had my M1 rifle that by this time. Oh, right, right. right. And, and, and uh, what, did, what kind of firepower did they have? The oh, enemy? they had their, what, what they call the burp gun. And of course, they, were, they still had their uh, hand grenades that, that we would refer to them as a potato masher because of the, just like the German hand grenade, which looked like a potato masher. Was and a burp gun, was it, it like a Tommy gun yeah, kind of? Yeah, sort of like a Tommy gun, right. And uh, it was just another form of a fast machine gun, really, when you held it in your hand. And, um, so, um, and, and did you guys all have rifles, or did you have the no, we all you had had a BAR with you? Well, uh, no, we only had rifles only, and uh, so uh, I got up to the top of the ridge, and then the second guy came up to the top of the ridge and plopped down to my side, and then the third guy, and then the fourth guy, and uh, and uh, just as uh, we got up to the ridge, the second guy that came up got shot in the shoulder, so he sat down in the snow, and that left the three of us. So then the uh, the third guy. Uh, uh, as we were trying to work our way down to this uh, Chinese trench, um, um, he got hit between the eyes, and he never knew what hit him. And of course, by this time, I was scared to death because had I you had you seen guys killed in combat yes. prior to this? Oh yes, oh yes. And uh, but this is uh, this is the closest that I yeah. got to, him, especially in my squad, people that I knew by name. Except the guy that got shot in the shoulder, I never did nothing to learn his name. But uh, so he just sat down in the snow, like, you know, I'm hurt, I can't uh, go on any further. So then the three of us continued down the hill to get to the, uh, to sneak up on the back side of the, uh, of the enemy. And then the third guy, he got a bullet right between the eyes, so that left two of us. So I told him, I said, I'm going to dive into that trench right down there and you follow me. So the two of us started to run for the trench, and I dove in first and landed right on top of a dead Chinaman, and uh, or dead Chinese, I guess I should say. And um, and as the second guy uh, was getting ready to jump into the trench, he took a hand grenade right to the head. So that took care of him. So I was in the trench all by myself, uh, laying on top of a dead uh, Chinese soldier. And, uh, and uh, so I got up and I started to move to my right and all of a sudden a hand grenade came right into the trench and it exploded. And it, uh, I don't know if it was the first one or the second one, but maybe it was both of them. But at any rate, uh, I was injured in the legs and I had a lot of holes in my back. And then um, uh, a second hand grenade came in. And by this time, I was clinging to the walls of the trench, and perhaps that's what may have saved my life because the explosions always go up, but because I was clinging to the trench, maybe that stopped it, I don't know, or I was just darn lucky. But um, so after the second hang and uh, um, exploded, then that, I, I knew that then both of my legs were badly broken that's from the knee down, and I was leaking blood like, uh, like a sieve, threw out a lot of holes in the back of my shirt or jacket. And um, so um, 
after that was over, then all of a sudden I was laying on my stomach, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, came this one Chinese soldier screaming at the top of his lungs, sort of like a death cry with a dagger in his hand. He was going to run up and plunge it into my back, which, I, by the way, I still have today. I, I managed to, well, I'll come to that. So um, luckily I had my 45 sidearm because I didn't have time to aim the rifle at the guy, so I just grabbed my sidearm and let him have it. So fortunately my 45 bullet could travel faster than he could run. So after I killed him, um, uh, then I crawled over with using my elbows. I crawled over and I removed the scabbard and and his uh, dagger. And then I, um, then I was leaning against the the trench, and uh, and I got to thinking, here I am in enemy territory. What are my chances of being captured prisoner, not tortured, or even being captured at all and getting medical care or what? So I, I managed to, uh, uh, I was in such a state of shock and pain and confused, I decided that maybe the best thing to do was rather than be torture, just end it all. So I managed to get my M1 nestled down between my crouch with the barrel up under my chin. And I probably would have pulled the trigger, except by this time I just passed out from pain. I just, that was it. I couldn't take any more. Between shock and pain, I guess that was it. So then the next thing I saw was a captain, and he was down in the trench, and he was looking down at me, and I guess maybe he thought I was dead. I don't know what he was thinking, but then he crawled out of the trench and ran away. That's the last I saw him. And then two other guys come from another company or, or division, I don't know which. I, uh, I never saw him before. Uh, they, they looked down at me, and I said, all right, we're going to grab you by your... Um, um, flak vest um, collar and your, my, um, my gun belt and we're going to pull you out and we're going to run like the Dickens. And so there they were dragging me uh, with my face down, I couldn't see much, uh, face down, my broken legs going all across the rough terrain which was not very comfortable to say the least. And um, uh, so, but it, I was a heavy load for these guys and of course they were running in a sort of a bent over position and not be up so straight because we were all in enemy territory, that's for sure. And uh, so uh, this one guy, um, well, both of them decided to stop and take a little bit of a rest. And I managed to turn my head to my right, and lo and behold, there that soldier was that got hit in the shoulder earlier. He's still sitting in the snow, white, frozen, and dead. <laughs> So I don't know what would kill him from a shoulder wound, but maybe it was shock, I don't know. But, and that, that's all that I saw that I remember. And um, so um, while, while this guy was uh, leaning over, sort of, he was sort of on his, bending over, catching his breath. And, um, and then a burp gun let loose with two slugs, and he caught two slugs in the thigh. And one of them was right close, well, just inches away from my face. So, so again, I was spared. And then he went rolling off into the um, into the trees, uh, screaming. And then his uh, first lieutenant came out from I don't know where he was. Maybe he saw, but he went over and he rescued that guy and dragged him back. So the second guy that, that was with me, uh, he said, "I can't possibly haul you by myself." He said, "I'm going to go off for help." Well, I pleaded with him not to leave me alone. I <laughs> figured if I'm going to die, he might as well die with me. But he took off anyway and left me there. And then I thought to myself, now what? And, um, but it wasn't long, and then six chogis, that's a Korean litter bear, they called them a chogi, and they came along, and the six of them put me on a litter, and they started running like mad. And they took me over to a, um, a crater hole uh, by one of our bombs or shells, and they stuck me in there, and, and then they, I guess they went off someplace else to find other, um, Guys. So then uh, I, I think I was in that hole for probably an hour at least, maybe two hours. And then some other American, uh, some another group of chogis came along and picked me up. And then by this time, we're starting to run downhill to get back to our friendly lines. And I slid off feet first. <laughs> and they kept running, and I'm screaming my head off <laughs> with, the, with my legs the way they were. And um, so. Um, uh, um, 
So they stopped and they put me back on and they carried me a little more horizontal. They didn't have anything to tie me down on it. And they ran like the Dickens. And it probably took a good two hours to get back to our friendly lines. And uh, uh, so by the now, were you bleeding all this time, or had the bleeding pretty well stopped? Well, it 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 pretty well stopped. It didn't hit any arteries or anything. Now, like tell that. me, the uh, there was snow on the ground. What was uh, was it like around freezing? Oh, definitely, so that definitely, might, because that the, the these chogies every once in a while they would stop to catch their breath, and one of them to my right, the right rear, he would rub it my hands between his hands, and that's probably what stopped me from getting frostbite on my hands. Oh yeah, it was definitely very cold. And um, so at any rate, that finally got me back to the so-called friendly lines. And then by this time, just as we got there, the, our tanks opened up and were firing right over the hill where we just came from. So I just got back in the nick of time. And um, so then um, um, <clears throat> I don't know if he was just a field medic or what, but uh, uh, he managed to um, uh, put, um, he cut off my boots and my three layers of pants that I was wearing. We believed in the uh, in the layer of clothing to try and stay warm, and um, and then he put some wooden splints on the side of my leg, and then he loaded me on another litter, and I was carried by jeep. There were three of us on the jeep, just like you used to see in Mash, and um, uh, so when we got back to a um, maybe it was a, a, a Mash unit. I, I'm not sure what it was, but uh, at any rate, there was nurses there. And the last thing I, I remember was that when this one nurse she came over and she cut off all my clothing and, uh, and then she said something about a shot and I guess I passed out again. So then they um, put me on a cracker box which is like a coffin only it's just plain flat boards and that's to stop you from rolling around all over the place. So that, that's what we call a cracker box. So they managed to get me down to Seoul and I was in Seoul one night from there, I, uh, they loaded me in another cracker box on a C-47 and went over to Tokyo and I spent about two to three weeks in Tokyo. And then from there they transferred me down to Osaka, which was a 279th General Hospital in Osaka. And that's where I spent the rest of my seven months and uh, uh, recuperating. And then much to my disappointment, and that's perhaps why I dislike the Army today again, is that um, uh, I thought for sure by this time I would get to go home. But no, they sent me back to Korea. Only this time they stuck me in the Provo Marshal's office as a clerk typist. And uh, I guess they figured I could still walk and eat and all that kind of stuff and I wasn't uh, 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 in that bad a condition. So, so is this in Seoul? No. This, uh, this was up, uh, well yeah, I guess, uh, no. Oh, golly, where was it? It wasn't in Seoul itself. It was with the second division where the MP company was stationed. At that particular time, I, I, I don't remember the name. It may have been Wijambu. Now, that's a French spelling. And um, I can't, it starts off with U I something, it's, but it's pronounced Wijambu. And uh, <clears throat> so um, they made a clerk typist out of me. And, I, and out of the uh, Provo Marshal's office, they have what is called the PMI, which stands for Provo Marshal Investigation or investigator. And uh, so I, I was taught to uh, become a, a PMI. And uh, now PMI, if it's a real serious case, they go out and get the facts and then turn it over to CID, which stands for Criminal Investigation Department. And if it's a minor case, like a self-inflicted gun wound or somebody uh, robbed a Korean civilian or something, then it's strictly a PMI uh, case alone. And um, so after being in PMI for a while, then they transferred me down to um, uh, Eighth Army Headquarters, which stands for, or, which is USAC, E-U-S-A-K, USAC, which means the United States, um, United States Army Korea. And um, is that in Seoul? No, that's what was down in uh, Taegu. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then. Uh, I continued to work in the in the office of the Pro Marshal. This is where the, the general, all the big shot generals would stay in Taegu. And that by that time it was in was safe hands for sure. And um, then um, uh, they, um, so I was a 
typist. I did mostly PMI work. And then after a while, they gave me the opportunity to learn CID, which I enjoyed immensely. So I wore fancy clothes and I patrolled around Tegu. And uh, any time that something happened in some other division or wherever, uh, they would call down for CID to come and, and uh, uh, take the case over. And, um, um, and that was the purpose of CID. So this but, would be an investigation? Yeah, type? it's criminal investigation. It's sort of like a, 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 a detective. Today, you know, you go to the police department, you have a plainclothesman detective. I didn't wear rank, and um, but I, uh, that's what I was in was CID. And um, did you wear a uniform or? Yeah, a yeah, I just wore the regular uh, uh, uniform. And then if I if I'm patrolling around Tegu, I wore fancy clothes, uh, you know, polished boots and all oh, this I kind see. of stuff. Yeah, uh -huh. And um, um, and then on April the thirtieth, nineteen fifty three. I guess Uncle Sam decided to turn me loose on society, so they sent me home. Uh, were your parents still alive? Uh, yes, they were still alive at that time. <sighs> Having lost one son and with you in such harm's way, that must have been pretty tough on them. It was not? very tough on them. And as a result, they hated the Army <laughs> and President Truman also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, had your dad. Uh, uh, retired, had yes. he retired from the yeah, military. He, he retired by this time. Did, but did he work? Uh, was he did he work after he retired? Not he really, was? not really. He, maybe he'd do a, a little odds and ends, but as far as having a payroll, forty hours a week, no. Okay, so when you left Korea, where did you come back to then? I came back to L.A. And uh, what'd you do now? Mm, you want me to go into that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well. <clears throat> I, um, I took a liking to CID, criminology, and I uh, gee, that's, the, that, that's something that I like to follow through with. So I went down to the headquarters in Los Angeles, the police department, and I asked, I, and I told them of my experience and uh, that I would like to work in criminology. And I was told then that the civilian life is a little bit different than military life. We had what is called seniority. And so I could not see standing out there fifth in Maine with a whistle in my mouth directing traffic around. So I figured, okay, I'll um, try going up to, um, to um, uh, Glendale Police Department, which has patrol cars only. And at that time, the, the Glendale Police Department had specifications that you had to have 20-20 vision without glasses. You had to be a certain height and a certain weight and I could not meet either one of the three. So I figured, okay, I'll try the California Highway Patrol. And uh, they had the same specifications. So I figured, well, I don't know any trade or anything. So um, I figured, well, in as much as I disliked the Army, I went back to the recruiting office and I said, look at I says, I was in Hawaii before. If I re-up for another 20 years, could I, um, 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 get it, uh, get in CID and stay there. Of course, Vietnam had not broken out yet, so, but I made them, uh, I just made the, the request that I would stay in Hawaii. Of course, uh, if I'd known that Vietnam was going, I would have made them promise me not to send me to Vietnam, but they didn't anyway. I, I stayed there in, in Hawaii. So I re up for 20 years. And, uh, and then in 1969, uh, at doing CID work, that is. And then in 1969, my father passed away. My mom and dad were both living down here in Palm Springs. And um, um, uh, so my mom uh, came over in the summer of 1969 and stayed at my place for the summer and took a trip to Tahiti and several places. She did the same thing again in 1970. And by this time, uh, in 71, I was getting a little bit disgusted with the Army, and um, uh, and I didn't I like the idea of my mom being down here all by herself. So, like a darn fool, I'm kicking myself in the butt. After 18 years, I decided to get out. <laughs> if, I, if only I could have stuck out another two years, I would have had a really made. And, um, but uh, I, I just wanted out, and so I got out, and 
I came here, and in fact, I arrived in this town in my old 41 Ford, which came from Hawaii. Uh, I arrived in this town on August the 30th, 1971, and I rented a, um, a house uh, down there, which is now Rancho Mirage, but at that time it was Cathedral City. And, uh, and then uh, I um, sort of made a promise to myself that I wasn't going to buy the first thing that I saw like I did in Hawaii. Uh, it was a nice place, but I just didn't care for that. No, no, no. Let, let's back All up right. just a little bit. All right. Okay. Because uh, we got 18 years there that I'm uh, sure something happened. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they, did they, did you stay in Hawaii for 18 years in your yeah. then? Yeah. So they kept their promise from yeah, that way. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's right. Yeah. Plus, the, plus the four years that I was over there, uh, from 37 to about four and a half years it was, from 37 to 42. Now, um, and, and you did CID work the mm -hmm. whole time. Yes. And in what capacity? I mean, I, I would assume that you moved up in rank and things like that. Well, whatever, not exactly. Not, not exactly. They, uh, um, I, I don't know what, what their thinking was, but they just sort of kept me at the, I did not become an officer in no way that I ever become an officer. And uh, I suppose I could have, but I just, uh, it was really an easy life. Because there was no, uh, no now, war did, going Were on. you married? Did you get married while you were no, married? No, no. And um, it was very easy work. And um, I, I thought at last I had it made. And of course, if I had stuck it out for two more years, I would have had it made more so. <laughs> right, yeah. But uh, I don't know. I, it was so, when, after coming back here, um, I was too young naturally to get, grow up and draw social security. Now, had you. Um, how is it that your parents ended up in Palm Springs? My dad's health and the, the dry heat is what he needed. And um, with lots of oxygen, in other words, he was advised to get out of L.A. Yeah. and go to the desert or the ocean. But he, but he was told that he came to the desert to go down to the low desert rather than the upper desert. Well, my dad couldn't see that, so he went to the beach in Santa Barbara and the uh, the uh, dampness of the air affected him even worse. So then they made weekend trips down here and discovered that Palm Springs was a place for him. But uh, he continuously got worse. And, uh, had you come over? Had you spent much time in, in Palm Springs before you moved here? Well, ironic, ironically, in 1937, before we moved to Hawaii, I came down here. Uh, the first time in my life that I ever saw Palm Springs was in 1937. Oh. And uh, that, at that time, they had boardwalks in front of the Plaza Theater, and you didn't walk many blocks, and then it just became dirt. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, so you were renting a house uh, in, in Rancho uh, Cathedral City. Yeah, or right. It's just Rancho Rush now. There. And uh, so, um, uh, this one Sunday afternoon, it was in September, it was still hot. Um, uh, I decided I wanted to take in the Indian Reservation. So I went up up there with, in the canyon where Bob Pond lives, and they had a big gate across the road, closed until October 1st. So on my way back, I was traveling along the Highway 111, and down there were all, where the Cadillac Agency just went in, they had a little wooden uh, shack up on high off the ground, and that was the sales office for the homes pointing at Bankside. And uh, this, the sale of the price of those homes were fantastic. And um, ironically, I drove up as high as I could. It's a tract home, but there were three phases, and this was phase two. And um, I pulled into my own, very own driveway. It was up on a cul-de-sac. It was as high as I could go. And uh, I and the doors were were already locked, but the um, there was no uh, carpeting or anything like that yet. And uh, I sort of thought, gee, I like this place. I went down next door, yeah, I like this place. I went down to the corner shop, yeah, I like this place. So the next day, I went down to the sales office, which was a Monday, and I said, uh, he said, well, I don't have many homes left in phase two. He said, we're going to start phase three pretty soon. And he shows me this map where he has a bunch of thumbtacks in it. And he says, what, what place did you uh, park in or like? And I said, well, I said, I, I like this one here in the corner. He said, well, that one's sold. But I said, I parked my car in this one. He says, that's not sold. It's a pie-shaped yard with, with very little backyard. So my swimming pool's on the side of the house rather than the back of the house. And um, uh, so um, 
he gave me the key to to the place I'm in now, and he, and he um, gave me the key to the other. There was only two houses left in phase two, and he gave me the key to the other place. It had a little better panoramic view of the valley, but I still had neighbors living in back of me, where where I'm at now, there's no neighbors in back of me, and I sort of like that one. So we talked terms, and um, and before you know it, I bought the doggone place, <laughs> and. Um, um, and you're still living there. I'm still. I'm still. Uh, it's ironic that that um, this week, the day after Thanksgiving, will make exactly 30 years that I started moving into the house. The day after Thanksgiving in 1971. So, uh, 30 years it is. And uh, so, did you uh, did you start? Did you work here in Palm Springs? Yeah, I um, not knowing a trade. Um, I, uh, and I, there's lots of swimming pools out here, so I became a pool man. <laughs> and it was uh, easy money. Um, and it was nice, except when the winds blew like heck. How many pools did you have? Oh gosh, I, uh, I think uh, I started off with 30 and I got myself up to 45 or 50, but then I dropped back. And I was, all, I was working uh, three times a week on on one set of pools, like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I would call on one set, and then on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, I'd call on the other set. And at that time, we were doing three times a week service. Did you have anybody helping you? No, no. Except a couple of times, we got in a horrible windstorm up here in, in the north end of town, and um, two of the pools really got filled with sand, so I had my son uh, working with me all day Saturday to just clean two pools. <laughs> And uh, I told the guys, again, if this ever happens again, I says, I'm draining out the water and I'm going to shovel it out with a wheelbarrow. It was really thick. And um, so um, then in 1978 is when we had our first big building boom going on around here. And a lot of uh, guys, uh, a lot of other pool men decided to um, um, throw their hat in the ring and go grab their state contractor's license. And so I did the same thing. I figured why to build, build, build pools. pools, refurbish pools, fix pools, anything of that nature. But I did grab my C-53 license, which entitled me to build pools. And um, But I didn't build very many of them. I, I seemed to like refurbishing pools, like drilling a hole with a core drill, a two-inch hole through the 12 inches of gunite to put in a new return line or a suction line or whatever, re-plumb all this kind of stuff. There was lots of tools involved, diamond saw blades, whatever. And um, so I really, uh, uh, and then of course if somebody's motor burned out, they would call me up. Um, uh, my, my motor won't run anymore. What's wrong with it? So I'd sell the motor, things of this nature. So refurbishing pools and fixing pools is what I did most. I only built, I think, about three of them. Uh, I can tell you this, um, that time, and it's probably still true today, I don't know for sure, but um, at that time, <clears throat> the C-53 license, <coughs> excuse me, the C-53 license to build pools, uh, they had the highest bond that I had to put up. I had to put up a $10,000 bond where everybody else had to put up a $5,000 bond. And the liability insurance was quite high. At that time, it was something like $7,000 a year. Today, I understand that's about close to $20,000 a year. So that's why I, um, I, I just uh, couldn't, couldn't stay in this. So I, I, uh, I still carried my C-53 license, but I converted it uh, over to a, um, a regular, um, I forget what the number it was, but it's where you're allowed to go around and yeah. fix pools and things of this nature. It's not actually building. <coughs> and uh, so there, therefore that reduced my bond and reduced my liability insurance and everything else. When did you stop uh, working on pools? I guess, well, by this time, unfortunately, as much as I love the sun, I used to be a sun worshiper, yeah. um, but the sun finally got caught up with me, and my skin and the sun don't agree with each other anymore. And uh, so I have to stay covered up, wear long sleeve shirts, and then wear cotton gloves when I'm driving to stop the sun from coming into the window of the car. And uh, I'm plagued with this. Uh, uh, skin cancer all the time. I'm seeing my dermatologist uh, about every three or four months and I'm always knocking things off my arms and back of my hands, my forehead. Um, 
uh, I'm told that my skin over the years has just absorbed so much ultraviolet rays that it won't absorb anymore. And I could lock myself in a dark dungeon for the rest of my life, and these things are still going to surface. So I've just learned to live with it. So, so when, when did you stop? Uh, I think I, well, I worked my, my pool business down to um, um, about 15 of my favorite customers right through the center of, of Palm Springs. I wasn't going all over yeah. the place like I was doing. And uh, they were my, my uh, best customers as far as pay and not giving me a bad time and all this kind of stuff. And I think I only had about 12. And, uh, but people uh, would call, you know, through the word of mouth, they, people would call me up and say, I think I got myself up, up to 18. I didn't want that many, but I did anyway. And then in 1985, I, saw, I finally sold the remaining of the business. And then I, um, <clears throat> and then I, um, there's another guy up around the corner, that uh, on my corner, that um, fixes pools also. So a lot of times I would just, uh, well, I, I, I continue to fix them also, but uh, not, not too heavy of a job because I had to watch out standing in the sun. Yeah. And uh, I had to wear a lot of clothing, and of course, uh, during the summertime, I would get very hot, and uh, I didn't like that anymore. So, um, uh, but if I got a big project going, and if this other guy was a little bit slow, I would hire him, just paying piecemeal, not on the payroll. I didn't want to become an employer. and. Um, uh, and then likewise, if, uh, if he got real busy on a big project, and if I wasn't too busy, he'd, he'd hire me. And uh, so we worked together like that. I officially quit the business, I think it was 1988 or maybe 87. And, um, and then um, uh, 10 years ago, 1989, I did a little bit of hotel security work but uh, because of uh, trying to stay out of the sun, <clears throat> uh, I did graveyard shifts from 8 to 4 in the morning. Or no, the first place was this new Stouffer's Esmeralda Hotel. It's a different name now, but I helped open that place. And the hours there were from midnight until 8 in the morning. Well, I'm a poor day sleeper, and I could not... Uh, uh, I could just uh, I could go to bed and maybe sleep about an hour. Then I'd wake up and I see the light coming in through the window. I hear the birds chirping, and I figured it's silly for me to lay here in bed when I got to do this and do that. And I just couldn't stand it. So I, I quit that job because I found another place here in Palm Springs that uh, where I was working alone. There was no not a gang of uh, security officers, and um, um, so I worked alone. And the hours were from eight to four. Well, that was not too bad, but uh, because I would get to bed about 4.30 and I would sleep until about 8.30 or 9, but then again, I was losing sleep, continuously losing sleep. And of course, I'm eating breakfast at 12 noon, which, was, which wasn't which was right. And uh, I was eating dinner uh, about 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, then I would brown bag it and take a lunch at midnight. <laughs> and this just upset my whole system. So um, <clears throat> in 19... Uh, in fact, it was it was December the 31st, 1907 or 1991. Uh, I said that's it. So I I haven't worked since. Yeah. Uh, and when did you get married? Um, 1966. Okay. And what's your wife's name? Irene. And where did you meet her? I met her in L.A. What was she doing there? She was working in an insurance company. Uh, what what was her maiden name? Garcia. Garcia. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, where did, where were her parents from and stuff? Where did what was her background? Gosh, I don't know too much about that. Yeah, I think they were. I, yeah, I think they were all from Texas. Uh -huh. And uh, how many children do you have? Just two sons. And what's their names? Larry and John, J-O-N. And uh, what do they do? Larry is now, he'll be 45 on the 27th of this month. <clears throat> he is now an electrical engineer down in Phoenix, Arizona. <clears throat> and he's the, he, he, he um, what he does, he works directly under the boss. 
and he, they have several big projects going, big, big projects. And um, what he does, he used to be foreman of a single project and tell his workers what to do, what to do today and all, all that kind of stuff. Now he's graduated to the point where he drives around and inspects the other foreman to see if they're following the blueprints right. And he has the authority to fire and hire and make a guy take it out and do it over if it's done wrong. And uh, so I'm quite proud of him. For a while there, I didn't hold out much hope for him because uh, uh, he just never seemed to get his act together. But um, when he went down to Phoenix, he really got his act together. My other son, uh, John, he, he was, uh, this last July, um, he just turned uh, 40. And uh, he has been for a long time a professional photographer. He works in a laboratory. And um, uh, he, um, uh, if, if people want artwork reproduced or something, he, he has a special camera and a special dark room to uh, do all this in. And he shoots pictures, or they use the computer now and yeah. make prints all over. Where does he live? In Ventura. <clears throat> Any grandchildren? One. What's, what's your grandchild's name? His name is Brett, B R E T T. Um, now, I know one of your hobbies is automobiles. Yes. Things like, tell me a little bit about that. Well, I've always enjoyed cars, um, even as a youngster. Again, going back to being a mechanic, mm -hmm. I would just pick up a tool and I knew what to do. And uh, this sort of overwhelmed my dad at first because he was, where did he learn this from? But um, I, I just, I've always loved cars and I've always had it in the back of my mind for many years that I wanted to get an old car and restore it. And at that time, I would had a Model T Ford in the back of my mind. Well, as it turned out, uh, my 41 Ford, my grandfather bought that brand new in Hawaii, and, uh, and then he passed away in 62, and my grandmother didn't drive at all, so in 63, I inherited the car. And um, it didn't need what is called a body off restoration or a ground up restoration, they both mean the same but it just needed a lot of cosmetic work. And by a lot, I mean a lot. Re-chroming, reupholstering, uh, everything. However, the original paint is still on the firewall and still inside the door frames, but the outside of the car has been repainted, but the same color. And all the fender welding has been removed. So what color is that? It's what they call Palisades gray. It's sort of a grayish green. It looks mostly green, but it sort of has a gray tone to it. And it's, it's a Dearborn car. Uh, I, I used to be a judge in the early Ford V8 Club of America, and I learned all about uh, what to look for so I could fix up my own car. You were a judge in what? I was a, uh, I was a master. I turned it, well, first I started with a judge, and then a senior judge, and then a master judge. So I had done it that many years. But I mean, it, it, what's the organization called? Oh, the early Ford V8 Club of America. And you still have that? Probably. Oh, yes. So, I see. Any other? You restored any other? Well, I um, I bought a uh, brand new, I bought a 1965 Buick Skylight Grand Sport, which was equivalent to the Pontiac GTO. And I had that for a good number of years. And I swore I would never get rid of it because that was a real performing car, I'll tell you. And, um, but in 19, um, 19, 96, or yeah, I think it was 96. If not, it was 95. 96 it was. Um, there was a, a elderly lady who is who just died recently. I found her obituary in the newspaper, and uh, she had a 1981 Lincoln Continental Mark VI, all white with blue velour upholstery and chrome spoked wheels with a white vinyl top. And uh, I, I, I discovered that the 
first time I saw this car, I was fixing something on her swimming pool, and then I went back a couple of years later, and um, and I noticed the car over there again, and I got, well, that's a beautiful little car. And um, so um, finally I asked her, I said, if the day should ever come that you would like to part with this car, would you give me first, first crack at it? And she says, okay. And um, so um, um, uh, about five years went by, and then on a Saturday she called me up, she says, are you still interested in my neck? And I couldn't believe my eyes. When I saw it, it only had 19,000 miles on it. Right now, today, as it sits in my garage, it's only got 23,000 miles on it. And um, I've taken that to a couple car shows, and uh, to the Lincoln car show, that is. And uh, the first time I was there, I won uh, first prize in my category. And then the second time, uh, I won the, the be uh, be uh, first prize of the best of the classification and I won the big silver cup I and mean, this this silver cup is you could bottle you could chill a bottle of champagne in it is so big and it says right on there best pr in the primary division the Ford Motor Company award and blah blah this with my name on it and uh, so that put me in the senior class and uh, so uh, when I had the car judged uh, again uh, March of this year up at Las Vegas uh, I only won second place in the senior division because when you graduate into the senior division, they really get to be picky. <laughs> Did you ever win anything for your Ford? Oh yes, I got a, a two Dearborns, which is as high as you can go. I mean, you you start off with a third, second, and first place, and then you get a, a Dearborn, and then you get a medallion. After that, I have a big plaque, and every time I get a medallion, I just stick it on. And uh, so I, uh, and then I got a little, a uh, little thing to screw up my license plate that says Dearborn car and uh, in order to win a Dearborn car out of a thousand points you have to have at least 940 and I got 965 and um, from now on all I have to do uh, the car will never be point judged again uh, I enter in the Dearborn class and uh, pop the hood open and the, and the the judges just walk around it just to make sure that it's still the way it's supposed to be. But that's all. That's no, no more point judging. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Do you still keep your eye, eye out for any other cars? I, I'm always keeping my eye, eye out for other cars, but um, I don't have no place to keep them. Um, there was a time there that I had seven cars, oh, really? <laughs> and it just got that. I built a carport over my driveway. Well, that took care of four of them, but the, uh, that still left three of them that had to sit out in the winter. Uh, and the sun down here is murder on cars. If not the rubber, yeah, the nice paint, it oxidizes it. And I just, I had car covers, and the winds would blow them off, or they would get rainy. And so I, I finally. Um, uh, managed to get rid of them. So I just got the four cars a day, two moderns, and, uh, and the two, uh, the, the 41 Ford and the 41 uh, Lincoln, which is made by Ford. So they're both backed into my garage, and when I pop the garage door open, I see the front end of both of these cars, and there's quite a difference in 40 years of design. How did you get interested in the Air Museum? Good question. Um, I heard, well, I wanted to come see the museum. Uh, I will let me back up. On opening day, November 11th, 1996, which is when the museum opened up, I belonged to the DAV, that's Disabled American Veterans. Uh, we had a memorial service out at the cemetery, and a uh, few of us decided that we were going to go and stop off and see the museum on opening day. And uh, I was still wearing my DAV cap with all the ribbons attached to the side. And, uh, I, and uh, but there was a huge line of cars trying to get into this place on that day. So the other two cars decided to go home, but I stuck it out. And I and ended up making a U-turn and parking down here at the Millionaire's Club. And, uh, and then they had a little shuttle pick me up. And they brought me up here. And while I was here, I was still wearing my DAB cap, and I was in the Navy hangar, and uh, this woman tapped me on the shoulder, and she asked me, she says, where do all the monies go to that you guys collect? And I told her, and uh, she said, well, if I write you a check, would you accept that? And I said, sure. She said, who did I make it out to? So I told her. So she went off 
to a place where she could write out a check. And um, she handed me a hundred dollar check. <laughs> I was flabbergasted. So um, uh, then I, at that time, uh, then my son came down here for a weekend and we came here, but we didn't have much time. And that's when I discovered that you had movies down there in the, in the auditorium all the time. So I vowed that I was going to come back here someday and spend the day. And uh, so that's what I did. I don't remember the date, but um, uh, at any rate, I came here to spend the day to see all the movies because I heard that there was a good film on B-17s, which I was highly interested in. And while I was up there at the counter paying my money or entrance fee, um, I don't know who it was behind the counter, but I just... I don't know if the conversation came up or how it came about, but at any rate, I mentioned that um, um, I was a BTG or bull turret gunner on the B-17, and there was a gentleman standing right next to me, and I think it was Mark Wilson, but I can't prove it. At any rate, his ears perked up, and he turned to me, and he said, oh, he says, we need bull turret gunners. How would you like to join the museum and become a docent? I never even heard the word docent all my life. <laughs> and I looked up in the dictionary and it says instructor or teacher. <laughs> it's just two words. So um, I, I saw the, uh, I, I stayed all day and I saw the, all the movies and, uh, and, uh, and I took a home in that location and I joined the museum. And you've been, you've been doing the, uh, the B-17 pretty much the whole time? Every, oh uh, yeah, it all, ever since. What, uh, what do you like best about it? I just like talking to the public. Uh, everybody that comes aboard that plane think that think that that's the most dangerous spot in the whole plane. And uh, I've heard it all. I'm that's I'm crazy. That's a suicide mission. That's got to be the worst spot in the whole plane. But when I get through, I, but I tell them I, I've heard it all in the four years that I've been here. I've heard them all, and I disagree with them all. And I explain that. I'll clarify that by simply saying. I feel that every 10 men on that plane is just as vulnerable as the next guy. Because here the Germans were trying to blow the front end of the plane off with a 20 millimeter. They were famous for their side attacks. They were good for their flak. And I, would try, and I, and I wore the backpack parachute. So therefore, I, I felt that the steel offered me more protection than the, um, uh, than, the, um, than the aluminum. And of course, if I wear the backpack parachute, that makes an easier escape also. Uh, I also, uh, uh, the f at first I always tell them the first thing that people want to know is how do I get in and when do I get in? And a lot of people, I guess they think I'm in there upon takeoff and landing, which is not true. And uh, so uh, when I explain it all to them, so explaining to them about bailing out and, and the safety of the steel wrapped around me and all this kind of things, then I say, now, can any one of you convince me that that's the most dangerous spot in the whole plane? <laughs> yes, a round, of, a round could come up, make a direct hit on me, kiss me goodbye, because I was at the wrong place at the wrong second. But I would rather have that steel wrap around me than the set of aluminum. And I always explain that. And then people, they agree with me. Yeah, 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 I see your point. I see your point. <laughs> but I enjoy talking with the public, especially the younger people that uh, don't know too much about World War II. I, I get all the time I'm told, thank you, thank you for saving the country, they shake hands with me. I've had numerous occasions where people have taken a picture of me, and I always hand them my business card and say, okay, you can take my picture if you send me a print, and they do. Most of the time they do, sometimes they don't. And, um, but uh, I, I enjoy it. I, uh, I tell you, if I didn't have this something to do on Tuesday, I, I would be a lost boy, <laughs> even though I still got plenty to do around the house. But, uh, Since September 11th, have you noticed people being even more so thanking you or being, or has it pretty much been you know, the same you might, all you might have a good point there. Yeah, I believe so, um, especially with the younger people, uh, because I think this event that happened brought back a lot of patriotism, and a lot of these younger people today, they just take life for granted, and they really don't know what patriotism means. And... Um, uh, but uh, yes, I, I, I truly believe that, and um, it's a little bit different kind of a war with no front lines, and we don't know who the enemy is exactly or where to find him. But nevertheless, uh, yes, it, it's brought back a lot of patriotism. In fact, just to show you, some, uh, to tell you something else, 
uh, a week ago Sunday, uh, Palm Springs had the big parade in Palm Springs, and I entered my car in the parade, and of course I had banners stuck on the side, Disabled American Veterans in Palm Springs Chapter 66, and all this sort of thing. And um, uh, so um, I was in the parade, which is a mile long, and I was following a marching band, and uh, as soon as I would get opposite the crowd on both sides of the street, everybody would stand up, applaud me, yay, thumbs up, waving the flags. And I even had one guy stand there and salute me. <laughs> and it's a little bit hard to salute back when you try to drive a car. But nevertheless, uh, I saw this. Now, two things come to my mind. Are they cheering me because of the old car that I had in the parade? Or were they cheering me because I'm a DAV? I, 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 I don't know. It's probably I, I, DAV, sure. right? Because sure. it was spelled out "disabled American veterans," oh, sure. and uh, but, uh, I got a tremendous amount of cheers. Now, whether or not everybody got cheers when they got opposite the crowd, I don't know. I have no way of knowing. But it just seemed like uh, as soon as I got opposite the crowds on both sides of the street, they would just stand up, they would clap, they would wave their flags, and a couple times they would start to run out to me and, and shake my hand. They didn't come all the way, of course, but. Uh, yeah. As I say, I had a couple guys, older gentlemen that were probably World War II veterans, stand there at attention and saluting me. <laughs> All I could do was just sort of do this in return. Yeah. But, um, well, but uh, it was. Uh, uh, I've entered the. In, uh, I've entered my car three times. Uh, I've entered my Ford three times, and I entered my Lincoln once. So we've had five parades, and uh, only one time did I not enter the car, and. Um, but um, that 41 Ford is quite an attention drawer, that's for sure. In fact, I've been, uh, uh, I've asked um, 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 Chief Ur Urban, yeah. I've asked him and I asked Tony what would be the possibility of displaying it down there next to that uh, 1940 Studebaker. And uh, they said that they have to check with Bob Pond. Uh, I don't know if anything will come out of it. Maybe he wants his own cars down here only, but I think it would be a novel. To, I'm willing to, to do that. It's true, I, I'm taking a risk that some kids don't try and nick it or scratch it, but I, I just like to show it off. And um, because it's, it, it's original, I, I've got the original radiator hoses. Well, I mean, they're duplicates or, or replicas, but it's an original radiator hose, um, uh, the original battery, Ford script battery, and um, so I mean, when you pop the hood, it looks just like it came off the shoulder or right off the assembly line. And um, um, the original clock still ticks right now today, and the original radio still plays today. Mind you, this is 60 years old. Do you think that you'll be ticking at 60 years from now? Tell me a little bit about uh, the, the, the working aspects of a 41 Ford. Stick shift, I assume. Yes, V8, column or? column shift, flathead V8, uh, and um, no overdrive. They do have a Columbia overdrive, Columbia rear end. They refer to it, and it is an overdrive, but my car doesn't have it. And I and I through my club, uh, I, I have uh, um, bi monthly. I have a magazine that comes out, and uh, they have a classified section in the rear for cars for sale or wanted to buy and then they have parts and every once in a while I see a Columbia rear end for sale but they're not cheap <laughs> they cost more than what my car cost brand new <laughs> and um, so um, unfortunately I, I don't have a Columbia rear end on it. I wish I did but I don't. Don, thank you so much. We well, really enjoyed it. That was great. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome.